We've got a secular environment that is very, very appealing even to Christians because we're fallen, and there's punishment in place for Christians not going along with that. We talked about that cancel culture. And so this causes Christians to begin to question the legitimacy of the convictions that we, they were raised with, okay? And this stage of questioning is called deconstruction. You do a lot in your work book on this, and I am so thankful for it because it is a huge issue that the church is facing now, so huge that our next year's reality is going to be focusing on that completely. Um, Introduce us to this concept a little bit. What is deconstruction as opposed to deconversion and the relationship of the two? So when someone says that they're deconverting, generally what they mean is they're just abandoning any notion of faith. And, you know, they're probably becoming an atheist, agnostic, or maybe nothing in particular, which is what a category that researchers give that where people aren't associating mm -hmm. with any of those particular labels. So that's more of the deconversion terminology. People use this term deconstruction in so many different ways today, yeah. and it, it, it can have so many different meanings. Sometimes when someone says, I'm deconstructing, and I'm going to say it, it's a little naively used this way because it's not really what most people mean by it. But I think sometimes they naively are just saying, well, I'm stepping back. I'm evaluating my beliefs and just making sure that I understand everything correctly as it aligns with the Bible. That's not really what deconstruction means, even though some people use it to mean that. So mm -hmm. we're always supposed to be looking at our beliefs and making sure that they line up with the Bible. That's not deconstruction. That's just being a biblical Christian. So mm -hmm. we want to get away from using terms that the culture is using in a very different sense. But what That's deconstruction means for a lot of people, or most people when they say that, is that they're walking away from the historic Christian faith and the authority of the Bible specifically. It almost mm -hmm. always means that someone has become a progressive Christian, they're associating with that particular label now, and deconstruction means they're just walking away from the things that they assumed to be true before about the authority of the Bible, and now they're looking at their faith from these different progressive eyes. So mm -hmm. it's it's almost always a signal that someone's become a progressive Christian. It's kind mm -hmm. of a fancy term for just that exactly. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, Tim Barnett has this clever little um, aphorism where he talks about this process because, as you've just identified, there is a completely legitimate place for taking a closer look at your convictions and and seeing if they're true. And in fact, if you're a younger person being raised in the church, there of necessity is a time when you cease believing something because you were raised that way and your parents believed in it, and you start believing in it because these are convictions you're willing to own. That transition can be hard. And uh, I have teenage girls, so I, I know what that's like. And it, and it even caught me by surprise uh, when it began to happen in my family, Natasha. And I, uh, and I know better, and it still really caught me by surprise. But um, so that's a good thing, that there's an assessment. Um, the problem is if they're in a community of Christians where there are no good answers to the legitimate questions that they're raising. And this is what you've, you've done with a lot of your prior work, um, keeping your kids on God's side, talking to kids about God and about Jesus, etc. So you provide a lot of good material there. But in this book, Faithfully Different, um, you offer, um, you talk about three steps of deconversion that um, well, you you talk about three steps of deconversion. You probably referred to it a little bit. Can you isolate those more specifically for us? Yeah. So what I what I'm trying to bring to light is that when people make headlines because they're deconstructing or deconverting, it's often because they are framing this narrative in a very specific way. That's not just hey, I just want to let you guys know something, but rather sort of reverse evangelism. They want mm -hmm. to tell people that there's good reason for you to reconsider everything too. And so it, it, it's kind of predictable when you look at it. And so that's why I've isolated it into these three steps. The first one is they'll announce the catalyst. So it's the catalyst of, you know, I, I've been a Christian my whole life or for many years 
years and I believe this just like you, but then I started to realize how unreasonable it was or how much the church has hurt people. Fill in the blank. There is some catalyst that they identify. And then the second right. thing that they talk about is what I call the avalanche of questions. And they almost always will list a series of big questions that if you've ever studied apologetics should come as no surprise to you whatsoever, mm -hmm. but that they identify as if they're sort of one of the first people to think about these things, to point them out and throw them out at you as if, hey, did you ever think about this? That if there's a good God, how could there be evil? Or, you know, why does God look different in the Old and New Testaments? Or have you ever noticed how many contradictions are in the Bible? So you start to hear all of these, this series of questions. And the implication is, I looked into these questions and there were no good answers. No one could answer my questions that I had. And so I've decided to walk away or deconstruct whatever the case may be. And of course, mm -hmm. if you're not well grounded in your Bible and apologetics, understanding how to defend your faith and these kinds of questions, then you're going to look at that and think, wow, they've looked into this and there weren't good answers. So what does that mean mm -hmm. for me? I haven't looked into it. And what other questions are there that I don't know about? So you have this avalanche of questions. And then the third part of it is what I call the happy ending. There's always the cap on the story that mm -hmm. goes back to happiness is the ultimate goal. They always tell you how happy they are. That's, mm -hmm. that's the big conclusion to the story. Don't feel bad for me. Don't worry about me. I appreciate you Christian friends, but I'm in the best place I've ever been. I'm happy mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. the implication is, hey, there's nothing wrong with what I've done. I've just deconstructed my faith, and now I'm happy. It and I really got rid of all that old bag. <laughs> yeah, I'm free. I got rid of all that awful baggage, right? I'm yeah. free to be yeah. me, which comes back to our old friend, the authority of the self. So when mm -hmm. you hear people talking about that, and they're free from this so-called oppressive system, and now they're back to their own authority, once again, we see the appeal in these deconversion narratives because it's encouraging you to think, well, I could be on my own authority too. You know, Natasha, as I reflect on, uh, and sometimes occasionally speak on my own conversion, my testimony about what happened to me in the mid-60s, when I left uh, the church that I was raised in, I guess you could say deconstructed and deconverted after a fashion, and then eventually became a follower of Jesus in the early 70s, I, had a, I, I, I mentioned this exact thing, this sense of freedom that I felt, that I have no God over me. No one tells me what to do. I can make all my own choices. And of course, I'm now emancipating from my parents at this time. This was for me in the mid 60s where there's a whole lot of things changing. And, and when you're 18, you know, and 17, 18 years old, you know, a young man, you don't want to think about, you know, religion and purity and all of that kind of stuff that messes up your game plan. And so there is this euphoria that one feels in, in, after they cast off the kind of shackles of religion. But, uh, and that's the appeal that's made here. So we, we talked about the legitimacy of doubting, of raising questions. What would you say, uh, and how do you characterize this in your book, Faithfully Different, the right way for young Christians to deal with doubts and for parents to deal with their young Christian kids who are dealing with doubts? Yeah, so I spend the rest of that chapter actually going through 10 different things to think about if you want to be an honest seeker of truth when you're dealing with doubts. And um, some of, you know, just to go over a couple of them, I think the number one thing that I have on there is to be honest with yourself about the nature of truth. Truth is not what we want to be true. It's not what costs us the least. It's not what our friends think is true. We have to start with just acknowledging that truth is going to be objective it's going to be something that's outside of those things and i think that a lot of times when you see people walk away it almost looks like there's this layer of this is not uh, christianity is not what i wanted to be true i wanted mm -hmm. these other things to be true over here so when you're going to seek truth we ha you have to start with just acknowledging okay i want to follow the evidence wherever it leads i want mm -hmm. to look for what's true uh, another so it's not it, this is not about what people like and right. uh, and this is to me this is one of the hardest things to get a, across to people I didn't like that about Christianity I like Buddhism I like those ideas well I liked Eastern religion back then because it was low on personal responsibility and high in human uh, personal freedom what's not to like you're saying that's not the right question 
the right question is what is actually so what is the nature of reality what kind of world do we actually in fact live in regardless of whether we like the answer or not exactly. that's the foundation that's that's got to be the first thing before you actually go on a genuine pursuit of truth is to ask that question and i think another thing and like i said there are 10 different things there so i'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head about some of the sure. more important ones from that but i, I forget that, what i write too so no problem <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm thinking back to that chapter. Um, but but one of the things that you see a lot today is the church is hurtful or a Christian hurt me. And therefore, I started deconstructing my faith. In fact, I just saw someone say this today, that's they, that they were really rethinking everything because they knew somebody, a Christian, who had really hurt them and, and their church had been mm -hmm. hurtful to them in some way. However they define hurt, I don't know. That's personal to them. But we have to be really careful to remember that even if a church did hurt you, and there are a lot of churches who have legitimately hurt people, or even if a right. Christian has legitimately hurt you, that has no bearing on whether or not Christianity is true. And we have to separate those things. We're going to have personal hurts in life for very different reasons. But that doesn't mean that Christianity is not true. We have to seek truth outside of whether or not we've been hurt in some way. So I think that's mm -hmm. another big one that people you tend know, the to irony, miss. The irony on this one is it isn't as if going into the secular world, you are going to be pain-free in relationships. Yeah, there's the safe place to go. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to say mean things about you. Nobody's going to hurt you. Nobody's going to cheat on you uh, or cheat you. Uh, everybody's going to be just wonderful. Of course, that's not the case because in both sides, Christians, non-Christians, you have fallen people who do things consistent with being fallen. You know, But for some reason, and I don't entirely understand it, but there are a lot of those who have deconverted precisely for this reason they've had a bad experience in the church and so they've gone elsewhere you know it doesn't make any sense to me I, and on the one hand it makes sense that they would be predisposed to question Christianity because of bad experiences with Christians that makes sense but then to say okay Christianity must be false and so I'm going to embrace a secular world where what you know it's like red and tooth and claw claw it's it's a nasty world out there you know, why is that any really better by this criteria? I don't know. But you said there are more. Yeah, and I, and I, I think you're, you're totally right. People are only seeing it from one side. And I think that's one of the other points that are in there, that, that you also have to think about not just what you're walking away from, but what are you walking to? So many people don't think about that. They just know I'm going to reject this, but they don't consider the actual worldview that they're going to hold next. They don't realize right. that there are unanswered questions in every worldview, that they're going to have doubts in any worldview because there are unanswered questions. They're only thinking about what they're walking away from. And, and I think that that is something that's hugely important, I think, for parents especially to communicate to their kids because you so, see so many kids who walk toward this mm -hmm. sort of nothing in particular well, you mm -hmm. don't have a actual nothing in particular worldview. Right. Every person right. has a worldview. And the same researchers that we were talking about earlier uh, from Arizona Christian University, they've also shown that 88% of Americans have an inconsistent, incoherent worldview. It's just pure syncretism. Right. They're picking and choosing and pulling and this isn't just Christians. This is mm -hmm. everyone. When you look at the philosophical right. underpinnings of people's worldviews and you actually look at the beliefs that they claim to have, they don't line up. They are not actually logically consistent with one another. So this, this comes back to if you're going to walk away from something, make sure that you've actually thought about this new worldview that you're claiming to have. Does it logically make sense? Does it actually mm -hmm. correspond with reality? Is there evidence for the truth of it? Yeah, the question I ask at this point is simply what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Okay, so I understand. I'm completely sympathetic to the idea that people who get hurt in the church um, by people doing bad things to them become atheists. Okay, but now there's no God. Yeah. So what, what moral sense do you make of the behaviors of the people who hurt you before if you are convinced that there's no God? Because what they were doing is just stuff. There's no basis for objective morality. And this is another discussion that sometimes... Christians get confused on. But if there is no lawmaker, there are no objective laws. There are just people's opinions about things. They're stuck in a relativistic world. Okay, so if you get rid of God, now you've just gotten rid of the kind of morality that you were expressing 
concern about regarding the Christians who hurt you. So now what? And I think there's a lot of ramifications to that kind of a move, but uh, the moral one is just one of them. But I, this is what you're getting at. And I, um, and I think this is a question that, as you pointed out, parents have to ask their own children. Okay, what's next? What's the alternative? There is no such thing as a nothing. You are going to something else. You reject one thing, you have to go to something else. You reject God, that's atheism. Now, what does atheism give you in your life that's going to help resolve other issues? 